My name is Jim Granado. I am the Dean of the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston. Before we start our program, this is a reminder, please share any questions you have for our speakers in the chat. I'll do my best to ask our speakers as many audience questions as our time allows. We have a great panel today to discuss the latest news and analysis about Texas redistricting process and census findings. Amongst our panelists are Professor Dick Murray. He served as political science professor. He served in political science at the University of Houston for more than 50 years. For those millennials out there, back then, Dick Butkus and Gail Sayers were in their prime. <laughs> He's also co-founded the Center for Public Policy and its survey questions in 1981, as known as a pioneer in the art and science of polling and elections. He's provided political analysis for local and national media for decades. He is currently a senior research fellow with the Hobby School. And let me add one final thing. Dick recruited Renee Cross and myself. So anything that goes on to Hobby School is always his fault. <laughs> Professor Michael Adams is a political scientist who specializes in electoral politics, redistricting, and voting rights. He is a former interim dean and chair of the political science department at Texas Southern University and currently holds the position of founding director of the executive MPA program at the Barbara Jordan McAleelian School of Public Affairs. As a former dean of the School of Public Affairs and chair of the political science department, Dr. Adams has pressed forward with a student-centric approach to the entire operation within the department. Dr. Mark Jones is a fellow in is a fellow in the political in the political in political science at the Baker Institute, and the Joseph J Joseph D. Jamail Chair in Latin American Studies and a professor in the Department of Political Science at Rice University. He also serves as the faculty director of Rice Rice's Masters of Global Affairs program and as a senior research fellow at the Hobby School. Dr. Jones' research focuses on the effect of electoral laws and other political institutions on governance, representation, and voting. Renee Cross is the Senior Director of the Hobby School of Public Affairs. She worked as a District Director in the Office of State Re Representative Garnett Coleman before joining the Center for Public Policy as a researcher more than 20 years ago. Her research focuses on Houston and Texas politics and de development and government. In addition, she is the High Priestess of our intern programs and talks to all kinds of folks all the time about politics in the area. Welcome to all of you. I'd like to start with the first question. And ground rules are such, I'm gonna probably call one of you to start, but feel free to join in as we go forward. So before we discuss the redistricting process and the new redistricting maps drawn by the legislature, let's start with discussing the results of the 2020 census and the population change happening in Texas now. What are the most notable changes in Texas population from 2010 to 2020? And don't let that limit your answer, by the way. Renee, would you take this first? Yes. Um, well, the good news is Texas saw the largest gain uh, in just sheer numbers in the nation. Our uh, population gained approximately 4 million people, according to the 2020 census. Um, Bad news is we also had the largest undercount, at least by early estimates. Um, we missed at close to 400,000 people in 2020. Now, that equals a 1.28% uh, undercount, which, you know, 1.28 is kind of a, sounds like a low number. Um, that percentage was only beat by Mississippi, which God bless Mississippi. Uh, their undercount was 1.30. Uh, but when you have a state as large as Texas, even a 1.28 undercount makes a huge difference. Um, if we would have had, say, much closer to an accurate count, Texas would have gained three congressional seats instead of the two that it did gain. But beyond just the, that political power ramification, um, you know, there's other ramifications that we will feel for the next 10 years. Uh, for example, um, you know, $1.5 trillion is allocated across the nation. And those allocations are based on these numbers. It appears that we will lose approximately um, 
$13.6 billion in the state of Texas due to this undercount. Um, you know, again, you know, last year was a year that obviously we don't want to repeat for many reasons. Um, even in the best scenario, Texas tends to have an undercount just because a large proportion of our population is in that hard to count uh, group that could be immigrants, it could be very young people, it could be the elderly. Um, so we've got some built in demographic challenges for an accurate count just to begin with. But then of course, if you add the pandemic, you add hurricanes, um, the politicization of are we gonna exclude undocumented people? Are we gonna ask a citizenship question? Um, you know, all of those led to that undercount, which again is gonna cost us, you know, big dollars. But one thing uh, that we didn't do, at least in my opinion, that we could have done to uh, increase the accuracy of our count is we could have had some sort of state statewide education program, um, you know, promoting the census and why it's important. We've had those in the past, maybe not well funded, but we've had some. In 2019, the legislator just legislature decided to appropriate zero dollars to our education campaign. California um, allocated almost $200 million. And while their uh, count wasn't exactly perfect, it was much more accurate than ours. And while I'm, I'm picking on other Southern states, even Alabama, appropriated uh, money for an education campaign. So this isn't necessarily, you know, a red versus blue state thing, um, but our legislature decided not to um, invest in this type of outreach program up until September, a little bit, I believe it was a little bit less than a month before the, the new deadline they appropriated some of the uh, COVID, the federal COVID dollars, but of course it was too, too late. Um, so again, you know, it, it's more than just about how many congressional seats you win. We're talking a lot of money when you're talking, you know, millions and billions of dollars that we didn't get to our state that went to California. So setting the stage, let's get back to the numbers. Again, uh, 29,145,505 is exactly what we had according to the census. That's a 16% jump. Um, as most folks know that have been following the development of these numbers, 95% of that population increase came from people of color. 2 million of that 4 million that we gained came from Hispanic Texans. At this point, or well, I shouldn't say at this point, as of 2020, the white population was only half of 1% larger than the Hispanic population. Now, again, keep in mind, Hispanics are in that hard to reach uh, category. And one year later, I think it's probably a pretty good guess that the Hispanic population is indeed the largest um, group within the state. So whites are at 39.8, according to 2020, Latinos 39.3, Blacks 13%, Asians just over 5%. And just to give some perspective, Texas gained uh, nearly 11 Hispanics for every one white resident. And of course, we've seen a lot of um, media attention about the, the growth in the Hispanic community, but the Asian community also uh, is making a big difference. Now their numbers, of course, aren't anywhere near, just in sheer numbers, aren't anywhere near the population size of whites or Hispanics or, or blacks, but 
in the 10 years, the Asian population grew by over 600,000 people in Texas. The white population gained only 182,000, just to kind of give you some idea. Um, the Asian population, again, even though not in numbers, but just in percentage and growth rate, is the fastest growing group in, in the state. All these folks um, are primarily in our large urban counties and cities. I know, um, I'm sure Dr. Murray and, well, actually all of my colleagues here will be talking more about that. Um, and as anyone that drives in Houston, Texas or Austin knows, um, I, I don't think there's any doubt that the folks are continuing to come to our urban centers here in the state. Since 2010, 44% of the state's growth has taken place in five counties, Harris, Dallas, Tarrant, Bear, and Travis. Hayes County, which is between Austin and San Antonio, more than doubled in 10 years more than doubled. Can you imagine what we would be doing if, if the city of Houston doubled in 10 years? Um, closer to home, uh, Fort Bend is, continues to be one of the fastest growing counties uh, in the state. They grew by 41%. But again, in sheer numbers, Harris County by far had the largest growth. Harris County grew by um, over 600,000 people. Again, 10 years over, over half a million people. So uh, in short, what does all this mean? We gain two seats as far as the congressional representation goes. And this stays consistent with what we've seen um, in the last 40 years and really, I guess the last uh, 60 years. Texas has continued to gain at least one or two seats every 10 years, say unlike a California that still, you know, is much larger than we are, but California actually lost a seat uh, in 2020. So the big message is we're continuing to grow, uh, but the residents are electorate, are, um, look considerably different than Texas residents looked say 40 years ago. Thank you, Renee. I must move on to the next question, and, and I want to ask Michael to take the lead on this. Regarding the new maps passed by the legislature, how do they change district lines statewide and for the Houston area? Yes, um, I think one of the most egregious uh, events to happen uh, in the redistricting session was to take, I guess, the centerpiece of the 18th congressional district and move it into the 9th Congressional District. And I would like to start with the, the history of the 18th Congressional District. Uh, many people believe that that district was created for the late uh, Barbara Jordan. And uh, also uh, she was succeeded in the Congress by Mickey Leland, uh, Craig Washington, and now we have Sheila Jackson Lee representing that district. And so what happened in the initial map they took the third ward area, uh, Texas Southern University, U of H, downtown Houston, and took that out of the 18th Congressional District and moved it to the 9th Congressional District represented by Al Green. Now, I think for the audience, we have to understand and talk about community of interest. Uh, certainly in the redistricting process, and in Texas, they don't always adhere to this, uh, there should be a common policy or concern that you keep people together and they will benefit from a single district based upon the understanding that there is a community of interest. And certainly that community could be shared uh, goals in terms of policies, uh, culture. Uh, also, if you look at the two largest educational institutions, why take U of H and why move Texas Southern University out of the 18th congressional district? And so uh, there was a lot of hue and cry to that and eventually uh, when the maps got to the Texas State House of Representatives, uh, Representative Thompson, Sophronia Thompson, uh, 
actually was able to get uh, Representative Lee's house moved back into the 18th Congress Congressional District. And also we were able to keep U of H and TSU. Now, what does that speak to the community in terms of black politics? You know that this is the hub in terms of the third ward and portions of the fifth ward is the heart and soul of the black community. And all of, most of our black political codes and even the current mayor of Houston attended the University of Houston also, uh, Gene Locke and others, when we think about black politics, we think about activity that actually took place on Texas Southern University's campus. And both Barbara Jordan and Mickey Leland were students of, at Texas Southern University. So again, that, that, that was kind of harsh and we got a lot of protests and eventually we did get that. But right now we still see two major communities within the 18th Congressional District were moved and they are in the 9th Congressional District now. That's Sunnyside and South Park. Right. Dick, did you want to, I would like to ask you a question about the state's demographic shifts and how it accelerated um, nearly all growth in big metro areas, mostly driven by minorities and who lean Democratic. Am I commenting on that? Pouring down into the census data, uh, partly as a consultant to the Black Legislative Caucus and the Black Congressional members. Okay. Population grew and the Latino population grew. Stations dispersed. Virtually all the old traditional Black and Latino Looks like Dick is frozen. Yeah. So, um, what I'd like to do is then, Mark, um, let's take this to the next question. And when Dick gets back, we'll have him talk about this. So, how does the level of competitiveness of the new district compare to the old districts? Well, we, we went from a situation in 2020, and this we can sort of look at it at U.S. House level, Texas House level, Texas Senate level, but let's just stick to the U.S. House for simplicity reasons. So under our, pre, as of the most recent election, 2020, Texas had 36 seats, uh, 23 were held by Republicans, 13 were held by Democrats. But of those 36 seats, we would arguably say that about 10 were sort of competitive. There were the two competitive Democratic districts, uh, Mark Vizzi, I mean, Colin Allred's up in uh, Dallas, in Dallas, and Lizzie Fletcher's down here in Houston, and then eight competitive Republican districts. So there was a lot of interest, a lot of focus, a lot of money, and, and really important votes in terms of participation, and in a sense that what tech, how Texas voted would have a major impact on the election results in 2020 in 10 of our 36 districts. As Renee mentioned, we increased. We were the one state that increased, and we went up to 38. Uh, of those 38 districts, after the redistricting cycle, we're in a situation where, of the 38 seats, really only two are competitive, uh, maybe three. But there's one uh, district, uh, 15, that runs from uh, McAllen all the way up to Seguin. That's a swing district. It probably leans a little Democratic, but it could go either way. And District 23, which runs from San Antonio down to Eagle Pass, Maverick County, and then out to the lower El Paso Valley, that's represented by Tony Gonzalez. That's a swing district leaning Republican, although that's a district that actually leans more Republican now than did previously. So we went from a situation where 10 out of 36 were competitive to a situation now where probably two out of 38 are competitive. And so we're going to be back to really where things were in Texas during the first part of the decade. When we talked about competitive districts out of the 36, we focus on District 23. We're going to be once again focusing on District 23 along with District 15. Is he Dick's back? Yeah, he is. Go ahead, Dick. A uh, couple of points. The changes in the population patterns a made it much more difficult to pack minorities into a small number of districts, but easier to crack them uh, into these larger districts that disperse, particularly in the state Senate and the congressional maps. Much harder to do that in the state house, and we'll get to that later. But uh, so we've got minority growth, but 
now that the courts have basically turned the partisan legislatures loose to do whatever they wish, and, and in Illinois, they're doing a very Democratic gerrymander, and in Texas, a very Republican one, without much worry about judicial intervention. So the Republican legislature was able to use a very aggressive gerrymander for the congressional districts, state board of education, state senate districts, somewhat less for state house because one of the important different rules for state house redistricting is you must respect, if possible, county lines. And that hugely restricts the ability for creative gerrymandering. Senator Huffman over on the Senate side very nearly, lost, very nearly lost her Senate seat in 2018 because of her weakness in the uh, Harris County area and Fort Bend. So she dumped hundreds of thousands of voters out of that and ran her district way out to her ranch and more in central Texas to get away from the, these urban voters. And you can do that with the rules that apply to congressional and Senate districts. But uh, in drawing the state house, you, you run into these county lines and that stops you, which creates a more challenging environment. But there, this is a very effective gerrymander at the congressional and uh, state Senate level and almost certainly ensures Republicans are going to hold the majority of these seats for not just 2022, but for 10 years. The state house, however, they probably will lose it over the 10 year period, but not in 2022 because of the population dynamics. It, we're just we're probably going to add another 4 million people in the next 10 years and 95 percent of them are going to be persons of color and they're going to be in these urban counties. And so you're going to lose some of your Republican House members just by natural attrition, not as dramatically as in Dallas County, where they started with eight Republican members and ended with two. But uh, we have nine Republican members in Harris County. They can, we can all probably get reelected in 2022 and probably five can get reelected in 2028 just because of the massive population shifts. Well, um, what are the implications of these new maps and how will they impact the policies coming out of the state legislature? Well, it's gonna remain re Republican conservative dominated based on you know recent elections and likely the elections of 2022 and 24. So we're going to continue to be legislatively a very conservative state, in my judgment. Uh, and uh, th these maps really help ensure that. Right. And I, I agree with Dr. Murray on that. Uh, certainly, I think if we look at the legislature that came out of the regular session and also the special session, uh, Texas actually has become the poster board of extreme conservatism. And also, I think we could uh, mention Mark's study in terms of the ideological spectrum. Uh, I think most of the Republicans, they tend to be very conservative. Uh, and if you look at the way the numbers are and with the, the Democrats being liberal, uh, I agree with Dr. Murray. We'll get more of the same. And he just said until 2028, um, it's, 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 it's not, it doesn't bode well for liberals and, and Democrats in Texas. Right? Well, or even moderates. Yeah. Uh, we, we are already seeing, um, you know, moderate Republicans that are just choosing to retire. It, just look at some of our folks in the Harris County delegation. Um, we've got Dan Huberty leaving, Jim Murphy. Uh, these are, you know, seasoned um, legislators, but they don't quite fit that mold that the uh, leadership of the Republican Party is going. Yeah, I mean, you see that, you know, that, you know, you mentioned Murphy and Huberty. If you throw in Lyle Larson, those are three of the five most uh, centrist or least conservative Republican House members. They're all leaving. And if you look at the Texas Senate, the one remaining moderate in the Senate, Kel Seliger, is also retiring. Uh, and it wasn't that long ago when you looked at the Senate and the Senate, the Texas Senate, you know, it's Maybe in 2021, it's tough to remember this, but back as recently as 2013, 2011, the Texas Senate was dominated by centrist Republicans. People like John Corona, Robert Duncan, Tommy Williams, uh, Kevin L. Tithe, Bob, Bob Duell. That They were the group that really determined if legislation passed or not passed. Uh, that was back though when David Dewhurst was Lieutenant Governor and didn't say 
use all of the powers that the Lieutenant Governor is endowed with to govern, which Lieutenant Governor Patrick has done far more effectively. And when we throw all that together, that leads to a much, not only do we have a Senate that is essentially a, a Republican lock, but it's a Senate that is very much unified behind Lieutenant Governor Patrick and in terms of his ability to run the show, the one sort of fly in the ointment was always Kel Seliger recently. Uh, he'll be gone, he'll be replaced with a, a Republican, I wanna say Kevin Sparks is the last name, Kevin Sparks uh, from Texas, uh, from the uh, Texas Public Policy F Foundation, who will then be able, well, they're going to have pretty much a very conservative Senate, but is also going to be very much under the uh, direction of Lieutenant Governor Patrick. Uh, whereas as Dick mentioned, the House, it, while it's going to be Republican, is still going to, it's going to be a less solid Republican majority and one that isn't as uh, where the speaker doesn't drive the agenda the same way that the lieutenant governor does. The speaker protected as many incumbents as he could in the House redistricting, including the urban Democrats. Uh, for example, Ann Johnson uh, was the only Democratic winner in the state house in 2020, unseating Sarah Davis. Uh, and she was basically given a, a non-competitive district. They, by moving Montrose precincts back into the 134th, uh, it's not a district a Republican now has any chance of winning. Uh, so the map protected incumbents, but it also reflects the fact that the speaker's power depends more upon Democrats than very conservative Republicans, as was the case with Speaker Strauss. Uh, so the, our speakers from Beaumont, uh, Thielen, uh, really, uh, He's got, you know, he's got to get 75 or 80 votes to continue as speaker, unlike Patrick, who runs statewide in Republican primaries. So the constituency for the speaker is the 150 members and the larger part of his coalition are Democratic members now. Uh, he needs 15 or 20 Republicans and the Democrats. And that's the formula that Strauss used. And so the House will be the more moderating body going forward on policy and may by the end of the decade actually have a Democratic majority and speaker. But right now, it, it's, the, uh, it, it's the most moderating part of the state Republican power structure. Anybody else want to follow up? OK, I want to, I want to follow up with Dick on this point. And feel free to join in after Dick answers. You mentioned the leadership. Uh, and you mentioned the difference between the House and the Senate. How did this play out in terms of the redistricting process in both chambers? In the Senate, uh, it was totally run by Republicans. The, the senior senator, a graduate of UH, uh, John Whitmire, wasn't shown the maps. <laughs> he was given a safe district, but it, it was revealed to him at the last minute. Uh, totally run by Republicans. On the House side, as we saw when what, what Professor... Uh, was just alluding to uh, that the House actually did some debating and, you know, uh, Sinfronia Thompson was on the redistricting committee. She was vital in restoring a good deal of the 18th congressional district. Nothing like that happened in the Senate. It was a one man show. And to a degree, I think we've never seen before. You've got a, a really autocratic lieutenant governor. Uh, he's now got the votes on his Republican side with, with the uh, Amarillo Republican moderate leaving. Uh, that's going to be even more the case. So the House will be very interesting to watch because it's much more of a coalitional group. You've got some uh, rural Republicans, for example, that stopped the massive redistricting of the appellate courts uh, that was planned by Senator Huffman, who introduced a bill to create a gigantic district to dilute the Democratic success on appellate benches. Uh, the House stopped it because rural Republicans said, we'll never elect anybody again to the appellate courts. They'll all become from Dallas and Houston and so forth. So that the House will be a very interesting legislative body uh, with a speaker that is coalition includes an awful lot of Democrats, but the Senate, uh, it's, it's a, a one party body right now with a very, very strong Lieutenant Governor. The only way to break that is to defeat him in a statewide election, which is possible. He won by four points, I think, in the last one. Uh, but uh, the, the membership of the Senate is pretty locked in as a very conservative body going forward, even without Dan Patrick as lieutenant governor. Anybody like to provide further input? 
So one thing that strikes me, I think it was already mentioned that the Senate was the more quote unquote moderate chamber for quite a while, and now it's shifted. Have we, is there historical precedence for that? Have you seen this happen before, that kind of flip in, in, the, in the Senate? Uh, not of the proportions that we've seen in the last few years. Uh, the, the Democrats lost their Senate majority back in the 1990s, so it's been, it, it was moving to be more conservative and Republican about a decade before the state house shifted. Uh, but again, with these very large districts, it, it takes about 940,000 people to fill in a Senate district, very susceptible to gerrymandering because you can, you've got to, you know, you can run a district uh, from Dalhart to Denton, uh, 400 miles. And you can't do that in the house. You have to respect these county lines and sort of like building a Lego with counties. So even in the rural counties, you can't be too creative. And the, the population growth shifts show up much more quickly in state house districts because they're much smaller. House district is about 190,000 people. So if we had 4 million people in the next 10 years, 15 or 20 house districts ain't gonna look like what they are today. Uh, and, and some of the members that can represent them now will almost certainly not be there uh, after as the latter part of the decade because of who are these 4 million people? They're coming within the United States from California, New York, Illinois, Florida, not the old Southern states. Uh, they're settling into the big metro areas because that's where the jobs are. And of course we have natural increase, persons of color, families of color have more kids, those are turning 18. So again, the house will be very much influenced by the dramatic population changes, but it looks like to me, the Senate map has got a lot of insurance built into it. That uh, even as the population shifts, the Senate districts won't shift enough to endanger Republican incumbents. Anybody else like to add anything to this question? Yeah, and I think what Dr. Murray is alluding to in the house, they have something they call the whole county rule. And that is something, uh, certainly, of course, you can't apply to the state Senate. But uh, I would like to ask Dr. Murray if they had used that for the congressional seats. I think Houston uh, could have had at least six uh, congressional seats wholly in, in the county. What do you think about applying that rule, Dr. Murray, to the congressional maps? Well, of course, the state does, have, does not have a tradition of enforcing a county rule other than for House districts. But yes, it would be a very different map if uh, Harris County with you know 4.7 million people, you divide that by, by six and you can fit six congressional districts entirely within the county. Instead, not. We, we've okay. got uh, a scramble. Uh, Crenshaw used to have a district entirely within Harris County. Well, he didn't win by much because of Harris County. So he got the hell out of my neighborhood and went up into Montgomery County. Uh, on the west side, uh, McCall's district, the 10th, a Republican district, uh, was getting shaky. So he got entirely out of Harris County. Uh, so, you know, we and we've got the 36th coming down from deep east Texas all the way to NASA. Uh, so, but, yeah, the county rule is really important. And uh, but it, it only applies in state house. And with the federal court saying, not our problem, do what you wish the legislators drew a very, very skillful set of gerrymanders for the state board, for the Senate, and the congressionals. I think, I mean, I think one thing that comes out of this is also, it, I mean, while a lot of the trends in these districts will change, a lot will depend on how the Republican Party reacts to that. Uh, so you know, the Republican Party can go sort of two ways in terms of these districts. That is, continue with some of the current policies or current approaches and candidates, in which case they may be lost. On the other hand, uh, if they, we saw, and we saw glimpses of this in some of the recruiting, uh, recruiting candidates of color, people like Wesley Hunt, Will Douglas, uh, Tony Gonzalez, Republicans have shown that when they do that, they can still keep these, some of these districts competitive in a way that they wouldn't otherwise be competitive. So there's going to be both the population shifts and then sort of it's, but then with the parties, the sort of what, how does the Republican party react to that? And is the Democratic party able to make inroads with the Anglo community, which is, you know, we, we talk a lot about 
the Democratic Party has, uh, or the Republican Party has significant problems with African Americans, clearly, uh, in terms of proportion of the vote. Latinos, they win 35, 40, 45% of the vote, but it's a minority. Uh, but the, it's flip, when you flip it around, the Democratic Party has a very serious Anglo problem. That is, Democrats generally win 30, 35 percent of the Anglo vote. And so it's, you know, so we so a lot of these districts will depend in part on how the different parties react. And so, you know, and I think that's and that's a debate that will occur within the Republican Party to the extent to which the Republican Party pursues a more inclusive route. They have the ability to retain some of these seats. If, on the other hand, they nominate you know, a conservative and 70 year old Anglo male candidates, you know, that, that, you know, maybe is not going to be there. They're going to lose those districts quicker than if they nominated somebody like JC Jatan out in Fort Bend County is a good example where, you know, where governor Abbott plays a pretty heavy role in uh, making sure that he was the uh, Republican representative. And that's the type of candidate that will give the Republican party some cushion where maybe an older, more conservative Anglo candidate would not have. The uh, big problem for the Democrats, it was revealed in the 2020 election, was the dramatic shift from the border to a lesser degree in the metropolitan areas of Hispanic voting. Uh, in some counties, a 40% swing away from Hillary Clinton to uh, com vote compared to Joe Biden. None of us knows if that's a short-term shift. Republicans have done well in the past historically in certain elections with Latinos, George W. Bush in 2004, but then there's a kind of regression to the mean, and the mean is something like 65% Democratic, 30 to 35% Republican. Can Republicans sustain those gains? Because that saved them in the legislature in 2020. Uh, everybody else pretty much voted as expected. Uh, blacks slightly less for uh, Biden than Hillary Clinton, but with more turnout. Uh, gentrifying areas continue to move strongly away from Republicans. The one sector of Anglos that's getting a lot more less Republican are the inner city precincts in Dallas and Fort Worth and Houston, where if you look at huge population gains in the downtown Dallas precinct, it's called 3008. Uh, it is the largest vote in the county. Used to be a Republican precinct. Now it's Democratic and it's substantially white, but there's not enough gentrification to, in Democratic gains there with white voters to offset the losses they suffered with Latinos in 2020. So uh, the biggest near-term headache for the Democratic Party is, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of Hispanic growth, wasn't reflected in the redistricting maps, but Democrats performed much less well with Latinos in 2020, top to bottom than they had in the previous five general elections. I think one other group that uh, we need to watch closely uh, next year in particular is um, suburban women and primarily suburban white women. We, we began to see them sh uh, leave the Republican party at least at the top of the ticket. Um, in 2018 and then in 2020. Now, after this year's sessions where we've had uh, considerably more conservative uh, legislation passed, I think that that group may tend to continue to trend uh, going towards the Democratic Party. So um, just as we'll be watching South Texas to see if some of these shifts uh, stick, I think we'll be looking hard at the suburbs as well. Following up on what you just said, Renee, do you think what happened in Virginia is just a short-term blip um, that you think the trend is still gonna go in the direction towards the Democrats? Well, I think it just depends on the state. Uh, again, we passed some of the most conservative policies in the country, in Texas. Um, I just don't know that that is the will of the majority of, say, some of those suburban voters. Right. And, of course, in Virginia, they're motivated by other things, like what Terry McAuliffe was saying about parental control of their child's education, which was probably a mistake. Yeah, I, I would even add that we could throw in Virginia and, and New Jersey. 
uh, just given the fact in terms of what we saw play out in terms of how that race was won. And then if you throw in the, the redistricting process and the Republicans gain, uh, it pretends that there are changes in terms of changing the, the House control of majority from Democrat to Republican. And also certainly that could bear out uh, either Biden not being able to get any of his proposals passed and even to more conservative legislation. So I think it's a confluence of all of those things. And, and we could throw in too, you know, candidates still matter. And uh, particularly in Texas, we don't have a real deep bench uh, as far as Democrats go, uh, at, at least in terms of statewide offices. So that's also a, a big factor. We should remind our viewers that uh, on in three days, filing opens under these new maps for all state and federal offices, uh, not local, but uh, the legislature, Congress, uh, the statewide elective offices, the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, and it closes uh, 30 days later. So we're, we're going to be in a very interesting period. On the Democratic side, we've had a lot of talk about Beto O'Rourke uh, jumping in the governor's race. Well, it's Fisher cut bait time uh, for Mr. O'Rourke and everybody else that's thinking of running. We have one of the earliest filing openings and closings in the country. And so, and then we follow up just 90 days later with a quick primary. Uh, and as Mark Jones was pointing out, there ain't many competitive districts around Texas in the general election. So let's watch closely who gets into all of these races around the state, uh, because uh, certainly below the statewide level, uh, most of the districts are, are gonna predictably elect a Republican or a Democratic winner coming out of the primary. Yeah, the, this is gonna be back to, I think so as Dick was saying, back to more 2014, 2012, where all of the, everything important occurs in the primary. By the time you get to the general election, you'll be deciding one or two U.S. House seats, probably one or zero Texas Senate seats, and maybe at most a half dozen to 10 Texas House seats. The rest of it's gonna be decided in the primary. And, and, and especially at the statewide level, unless the Biden administration really ramps itself up, uh, if it continues in the doldrums where it is now, then, probably Democrats statewide are doomed next year, which means that statewide is going to be not more of a cakewalk, which means, yeah, and that's, you know, and that's where we like, I think, and you're sort of starting to see that in the, on the Republican side, where you have a very disputed primary for attorney general, where, you know, because a lot of, you know, that will be, you know, despite the deeply flawed candidate that Ken Paxton is, he'll have, if he wins the Republican primary, he'll have an R next to his name, and more likely than not, he will still be uh, reelected. And so there, so we're seeing a pretty intense interest in, within the Republican Party of winning that primary with the principal goal of once you have it, you're a lock for November. And so I, I think it'll be also important on anybody associated with voters and turnout to encourage people to turn out in the primaries. Because this, once again, like back in 2014 or 2012, it's it's going to be your one time to actually influence who represents you, because by the time we get to November, uh, it's likely to be decided one way or the other uh, by the natural uh, contours of the district and the gerrymander. And we have a history uh, of abysmal turnout in the combined primary vote. Uh, a few subsectors, African Americans participate pretty well in the Democratic primary, Latinos generally not. Uh, uh, on the Republican side, you have about uh, 25 or 30 percent of the people who vote Republican in November bother to vote in the primary, even though the primary is for most of them the effective election. Yeah, I, th I think I remember looking at some of the top prime Republican primary statistics from it was four years ago, and the median age is like slightly over 60 of the person who turns out to vote in the Republican primary. <laughs> Yeah, it's an old folks home. <laughs> in terms of redistricting, the process is always controversial and Texas is no exception historically. So 
what's happened this time versus other times? I mean, what I'm thinking about is, is the word preclearance. And first, I'd like that defined for people that are watching and what preclearance means and what happened this time in the process. Well, for preclearance, thanks to Barbara Jordan, uh, to mention <laughs> one of our most famous local persons, Texas was not covered by the special provisions of the original Voting Rights Act of 1965. But uh, after Barbara Jordan got to Congress in January 1973, she made it one of her life missions uh, to uh, bring Texas under the special provisions, arguing that it had a terrible record of dealing with minority voters and African-Americans in particular. She found a willing partner in Lloyd Benson over in the Senate because he was looking to run for president and he needed black support. So between them, uh, Jordan over in the House and Benson in the Senate, they got the Voting Rights Act as amended and or repassed again in 1975 to bring Texas under the special provisions, including preclearance. So that if you make any change in your elective system, districts, voting rules, it has to be run either by the Justice Department or a federal court in Washington. And for a half century, that was enormously important. Uh, it ain't there anymore. You know, in 2013, the Supreme Court with Justice Roberts in the lead used an Alabama case to say, well, the circumstances have changed. And bad behavior doesn't exist so much anymore. And uh, the old rules are outdated. So preclearance went away. Uh, and also other rules have been changed substantially, giving the legislators much more freedom of action as long as they don't explicitly uh, make a, a res racially uh, dominated map. And they're, they're clever to avoid that. So it's a very different set of rules. There's going to be litigation. Uh, the Hispanics file almost immediately because they were the big losers in the 2021 redistricting process. Lots of growth and actually they retrogressed in terms of the districts they have influence in. So we're going to have litigation and some of it might work, but the, the, the field is much, much more tilted to sustain the conservative legislative adopted maps. Yeah. I mean, that's a key point I think that Dick raises there in that under the previous system, the maps would have had to clear either the Department of Justice or the Federal District Court in the District of Columbia. And if they didn't do it, then the courts would redraw the maps. And so that was a heavy burden of proof. And the burden was on the state to show that they did not retrogress and that they did not reduce the ability of underrepresented minorities to elect the candidates of choice. Now the burden of proof is on the plaintiffs, the people challenging these maps to show that these maps effectively undercut the ability of minorities to elect candidates of their choice. And the status quo is the maps will go into force while the court case winds its way slowly through the courts, which means they're gonna get used in 2022, they'll probably get used in 2024, and they conceivably could be around in 2026. And even if there is a change, given the current composition of the Supreme Court, we're at best probably looking at some tweaks at the margins where they don't make wholesale changes. I mean, 23, uh, which is the district that runs from San Antonio down to Maverick County, Eagle Pass, and then out to the lower El Paso Valley. That one, look, it's just very clear it's retrogression because you've, they took a district that's a Latino majority district, but reduced the proportion of Latinos in it by three or four percent. But what that does is it very strategically increases the actual number of Anglo voters to a larger share. So it takes a district that it makes it less competitive. Uh, that's one I have to assume eventually that that district at least will get redrawn. But once again, it'll be tweaking it. You'll put a few counties, you'll take a few counties out of Bear, uh, precincts out of Bear County, you'll do some uh, massaging, you'll make it a little more competitive, but that will be it. And so in the interim, these maps will be used for 2022 and 2024 and maybe even 2026. And even if they do change, the status quo will always be these maps. So even when the courts, if they do intervene, make changes, they'll be very minor to these current maps, which means that they aren't really going to change them all that much, which is a very different scenario. And, you know, I think that goes back to, you know, it goes, and in theory, in theory preclearance could be brought back. Because Section 5 still exists. It wasn't ruled unconstitutional. It's just the criteria to determine why states were included or not included were ruled unconstitutional because in the case of uh, the first group of southern states, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, et cetera, uh, 
that was due to voting statistics from the 60s, uh, from the 60s. And in the case of Texas and Arizona and Alaska, it was due to span, non -span, not having Spanish language ballots in the early 70s. Uh, so, you know, the argument, you know, there is, so it's, it was a difficult argument, I think, for the court because on its face, it was, there was a reasonable argument. That is that these, these criteria are from 50 years ago. And why should Texas and Louisiana be in, but Arkansas and Tennessee are not, uh, based, based on history? But the court also knew full well that Congress would most likely not draft new criteria for Section 4. So by gutting Section 4, they were, for all intents and purposes, gutting Section 5 and ending preclearance for the foreseeable future. So it was, it was, if you look at it from a pure legalistic perspective, there's some merit, but then you, in doing that, you have to realize that you are going, you're not going to refine and reform section five. You're just going to get rid of it until Congress can come to a, a decision to add new criteria, which is virtually impossible because it would require, especially with the filibuster, because it would require a level of consensus that simply does not exist in the U.S. Congress. And I like that word filibuster because I, I think over the next decade, the likelihood is that the filibuster goes away. If the Democrats have one good election cycle in the next decade, I think the filibuster's dead. Uh, you won't have, you, you've got basically one guy now, Manchin, that's holding it up in a 50-50 Senate. But the, the, within the Democratic Party, there's been a very huge shift. If the Democrats get back to 53 or 54 seats in, at some point in the next 10 years, the filibuster's gone. And it, once it's gone, it's never coming back. So, uh, yes, that's the only thing I see in the decade that gives some hope to the voting rights advocates is that the, the, this, the filibuster was overused and died because the Democrats had the votes finally to kill it, which they have not, never had, you know, in the last 75 years. But I think they will have probably in the next 10, because every now and then in a closely balanced country, you have a bad election. And in a bad election, it will give you 55 Democratic senators or something, and th that's the end of the filibuster. But it ain't happening in the next two years. So everything will be fought out in the court with the present rules. And I agree with Mark, probably some tinkering at the edges. Uh, maybe you have a Senate district, state Senate district or two. Uh, uh, you could argue that Whitmire's 15th district was retrogressed that it was an effective black district uh, in the primary and it's no longer so. So here and there, there may be some challenges that can work, but pretty much uh, for the people that are filing or not filing in the next few days, these maps are what you're gonna run in. Mm -hmm. And you know, you may not like it, but get used to it. That's what we have. Yeah. Right. I, I, would, I would also point out that uh, under the coverage of the Voting Rights Act, Texas did not make it through a single decade without a federal court telling it that it had violated either federal law or the U.S. Constitution, and then they were court-ordered maps. And so that's important as well to understand. Mark, you brought up, and this is for everybody, this idea of preclearance coming back. So let's take that idea and we'll add to it, you've got a trifecta. You've got both houses in the legislature are in one party and the executive branch is in one party. So you've got the three-headed monster, all the same party, plus you don't have preclearance. That's a recipe for more of this type of behavior that leads to extreme gerrymandering. You see it, now, and this is bipartisan because you're seeing the same thing in Illinois. Yeah, yeah. Right? So the question is, does that fuel the chance for heightened scrutiny of saying you that we need to do something about this to stop that kind of, I'll use the word mischief. Well, it's, you know, it is a perfect storm for extreme gerrymandering because if you think of sort of the, we, we on one hand you have, states that have independent redistricting commissions, some of varying independence and varying nonpartisanship. But they are because they have a process that they have to follow, they have, they're more transparent, you tend to get more even maps. You also can get more even maps when you don't have a trifecta. That is when one party controls the, the executive branch and one party controls one of the houses, or like we have over in the state of the Catahoula leopard dog uh, in Louisiana, we have you know, a, a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. So there they can't do it. But when you get in a state like Illinois or, or Texas, where you have Republican, one party controls both houses and the governorship of all Republicans here in Texas, all Repub Democrats in Illinois, and you 
uh, effectively have the Supreme Court saying that partisan, there is no such thing as too extreme partisan gerrymandering. And the Supreme Court has declined to really intervene on that. Uh, it's really how risk averse or risk loving the party wants to be. Uh, that's the only real constraint in terms of drawing the maps. Uh, does it, it could bring more sort of uh, scrutiny, but we've, what we've seen is we've had a Supreme Court that's arrived that's even more conservative on this issue than past courts. Uh, so I, I think it's unlikely with the current composition of the U.S. Supreme Court that we're going to see any movement backwards. Now, Congress could always pass something, but once again, as long as the filibuster's there, as, you know, until the, what Dick mentions with the filibuster leaving, we're unlikely to see Congress change. And even if Congress does change it with the current composition of the Supreme Court, I think you would get quite a bit of pushback to it on any federal rules intervening that essentially affect the ability of the states to draw districts. Uh, you, there's going to be pushback there, and it'll be up to the courts to decide. And, get, and given the current leaning of the U.S. Supreme Court, it's probably more likely to side with the states than it is with the federal government. Although, even within the realm of what I think most people would say is constitutional, there is there are some things that the federal government could do to reduce the level of uh, partisan gerrymandering on a procedural process or dynamic. One other problem for those wanting to challenge uh, these maps and the whole gerrymandering process is Texas is in the Fifth Circuit. That's pretty clearly now the most conservative federal circuit in the country. So in terms of uh, re challenging what we've got, it's probably a pretty good idea, and I'm a non-lawyer, but don't file a constitutional case attacking these maps because that gets you into a panel that's going to be dominated by the Fifth Circuit. Sue under the legislation, under the voting, what remains of the Voting Rights Act, and then you get a district judge trial in Texas. So that instead of having the, the trier of the facts being this court that's going to be dominated by the Fifth Circuit, who's already said, oh, one of our judges is going to be Jerry Smith. He was on the last round. He's, he's not sympathetic, let us say, to minority plaintiffs. So uh, the, the maneuvering, there's some opportunities here to improve slightly your your odds but uh this is a pretty gloomy prospect for the uh for minority plaintiffs uh and progressives in texas uh and uh you know but they're gonna the hispanics do have some pretty darn good arguments uh with what would happen in the big picture maybe they can uh they, they can probably win a district court trial yeah. in texas and, and at least and that establishes the facts. And then the appellate review, it, 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 you pretty much, they have to pretty much accept the facts that are established in the, the original trial. So, we, you know, we had on, uh, say, the voter ID law. Texas had a district court trial and lost. Uh, and, and yes, it didn't make any huge changes, but uh, uh, the, the maneuvering is complicated. But for the plaintiffs, they're a lot better off in a district court in Texas in the urban centers uh, than they are uh, with a, a three-judge panel uh, that will be uh, set by the Fifth Circuit. Oh, we've got two minutes remaining, and this is going to be a lightning round. I have two questions. First, I just want a quick answer two things. The first one is, how long do you think it'll take for these new maps to get through the courts? I think Mark alluded to it, but I, I'd like to hear what your best guess is on this. All four of you. <laughs> I'm five, five of you, I'm sorry, or four of you. Yeah. Well, first, I, I don't have much hope, and, and I think uh, Dr. Murray laid it out in terms of where we are and with the federal courts and the Fifth Circuit being the most conservative, all right? So, um, and probably uh, Mark suggested it would be some tinkering around the edges, not wholesale changes. Yeah. Well, if we look back at what happened in, what, 2003, I think it took at least two years um, to get to some sort of um, result. So you know, I would say there, if we're gonna be guessing, I would say maybe two years. Okay. Hey, so one last question and it's this, um, and this is not related to what we just talked about. There was a question from the audience. What are the expected effects of this year's quorum break on the next section? Any effect? I think it, I mean, if anything, it probably places a little more pressure on Phelan not to be so generous with all Democrats on committee chair positions. 
he's going to get a little flack, more flack from Republicans for doing that for Democrats who bolted. And I suspect at least a few of the Democrats who are seen as sort of ringleaders of the quorum break may not be as rewarded as uh, with committee chair positions. But I don't think operationally have much of an effect. I think it'll be more personal. There'll, there'll be a few people that will lose their committee chair positions and maybe a few people who gain them, uh, but it'd be mostly that. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all, Dr. Michael Adams, Dr. Mark Jones, Dr. Richard Murray, and of course, the incomparable Renee Cross. <laughs> and I also want to tell our audience that our next Hobby Hour in December will feature a conversation with Dr. Laura Murillo, President and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We're going to discuss her new book, Lead in Life, People, Passion, and Persistence, Succeed in a New Era of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She'll have a lot of life lessons in that discussion. We're in the process of confirming the date in December, and we'll be sure to let everybody know when it, when it, when it happens. Again, thank you all for a great discussion. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. And that's it for the Hobby Hour. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good to see you folks. All right. Thank you, Don.